Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I wonder if I'm here live on Instagram and here live on Facebook. It seems like it's working. I'm Hank Philippi Ryan. It is Thursday at 1230 Eastern, and this is, as always, First Chapter Fun. Um, happy Thanksgiving. Oh, here's Tracy and Al Pesson, both authors we read on Instagram. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And, and Anissa is here, and that's so great. Um, I see on Instagram. Happy Thanksgiving, Sarah. And I don't see any comments yet on Facebook. This could be one of those days that Facebook doesn't let me see the comments. Thank you so much, Facebook people. Aha, Shanson. Shannon Hansen is here, and Kimberly, our darling Kimberly. Hooray. So far, so good. Everything seems to be working here on Thursday on Thanksgiving on First Chapter Fun. I'm Hank Philippi Ryan. Um, my partner in fictional crime, Hannah Mary McKinnon, is here as well. And we are wishing you a happy Thanksgiving. I see Julie McMillan has joined us on Instagram. We are reading her fantastic book, To Tell You the Truth Today. And here she is on Facebook as well. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is so nice. Um, if you don't know Jilly McMillan, M Jilly McMillan, if you don't know Jilly McMillan, she is absolutely suspense royalty, um, completely so, one of my favorite authors ever, and I'm <laughs> nervous to read her book to you today because it's so good and she is so amazing and I can't wait for you to meet her. Um, she's here on Instagram and here on Facebook, and we're so happy that she's here this morning. It is gloomy and miserable and drizzly here in Boston. Hi, Diane. Hi, Lisa and Carolyn and Lynn. And, oh, this is great. You know, we, Hannah and I wondered whether everyone would be busy uh, on Thanksgiving and whether they'd want to come to First Chapter Fun. And we decided, you know what, we're here. We're here for you. We want to be with you and um, have you know that um, no matter what, we'll, one of us will be here with you to read you the first chapter of a wonderful new book, um, as we always do at Tuesday on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 12.30 p.m. Eastern, even on U.S. Thanksgiving, which is um, as bizarre as any Thanksgiving could ever be this year, you have to admit. Um, usually at this time of year, I have to tell you, usually at this time of year, the kids and the grandchildren are coming and you can smell the turkey cooking. Oh, look, here's Debro and Glenny and Lynn and Anissa um, and Beth. And oh, look, this is, um, and look, Beth is saying, love Jilly's books, of course. And here's Jen Jumba in Ohio. Um, <laughs> Jenna's saying, I'm grateful that you're doing this today. You and Hannah are so sweet. Oh my goodness, thank you. Well, we, you're sweet too, Jenna. We can't do this without you, as you well know. Um, and golly, you know, we give thanks for a lot of things these days, don't we? You know, not only for you all and not only for First Chapter Fun and not only for each other, but things like electricity and the internet and the idea that we can actually do this together every Tuesday and Thursday at 1230. Read a fabulous new book, get together, make sure that each other is okay, um, and share stuff about our lives. You know, my favorite Thanksgiving memory is, you know, I grew up in really rural Indiana, so rural that you couldn't see another house from our house. And we used to have so many people over for Thanksgiving and my mother would make a big deal out of it. And every year she would, uh, hi Hannah here on Facebook, uh, every year my mom would make two turkeys, one with oyster stuffing and one with stuffing without oysters because all of us kids said we're not eating disgusting oyster stuffing. You have to make two separate stuffings. So she made one turkey with oyster stuffing and one turkey with plain stuffing. And she was very clear each year that this is the, this is the oyster stuffing turkey and this is the non-oyster stuffing turkey. So, you know, you kids are safe and you don't have to eat disgusting oysters. I mean, she was making fun of us the whole time, of course. Um, so this happened for years and years. And then when I was about, I gosh, 26 or something, and I came home because Thanksgiving was a command performance in my family. We all had to come. Um, so I, I got home for Thanksgiving from my job in Washington, D.C. or wherever I was at the time. And I saw my mom in the kitchen. Hi, May. Hi, Brenda. This is so great. Hey, Carolyn. Oh, my golly. Um, 
and Shannon and Jill and Susan, and that's just marvelous. Anyway, so my mom made these two turkeys and she always made it very clear, this is oyster stuffing and this is plain stuffing. So once when I was about 26, I was in the kitchen with her finally, um, making Thanksgiving dinner with her and I saw her put oysters in the stuffing, in the bowl of stuffing, and then just divide the oyster stuffing and put, put oyster stuffing in both turkeys. So I said, I remember I just shrieked and I said, mom, mom, you're making a mistake. You know, you're putting oyster stuffing in both turkeys. Don't do that. You know, you have to have one plain. And she's like, oh, honey, why would I make two different turkeys with two different stuffings? I have never done that. You kids have been eating oyster stuffing for years and uh, you never knew it and you never complained. And I just figured I'd just keep up the pretense and you all would never know. Um, so, so my mom pulled a fast one on all of us all those years. Um, and now it's one of my favorite Thanksgiving stories. I know Tracy mom and Brenda's saying she's listening while she sets the table. That is so nice. Um, so I know you all have Thanksgiving stories of your own and that's one of the things we treasure. Um, on First Chapter Fun, right? Sharing stories, especially wonderful new books like today's book, To Tell You the Truth, by the fabulous, incredible, extremely, excruciatingly talented Jilly McMillan. Um, she, and I have to tell you, let me tell you a little bit about Jilly before we start, but first let me warn you, welcome first of all, before I say anything else, welcome, welcome, welcome to all of you. I see the numbers just going up and up and up and up and up. Shannon is saying we're doing a turkey even though there are just three of us. It's my favorite. Yeah, and it smells so good when they're, when they're cooking. Don't they just, that fragrance of turkey is so delicious. Uh, Carolyn's saying, ugh, my husband's family is obsessed with oyster dressing. Yeah, you know, I thought I hated it, but I guess I don't since I've been eating it for all these years. It just looks bad, right? It looks bad. Marissa's saying, oh, happy Thanksgiving, Hank. I'm thankful for you and your books. And Hannah is whispering on Facebook, I don't like turkey. Okay, we will have to discuss this. If I, I live on turkey, I have turkey every day. And the fragrance of turkey and the deliciousness of turkey. Hannah, you'll have to come to Thanksgiving at our house in Boston. Um, and whether you like turkey or not, we'll make something else for you. Um, but it would be really fun. Next year, what if we do this together at one of our homes? and we'll do a joint first chapter fun together. That would be, that would be great. Brenda's saying, I hope I don't burn the rolls this year. That would be three years in a row <laughs> and would cement a family tradition. I know the thing is gravy and sometime we'll have to talk about gravy. Every year I freak out because I forget how to make gravy and I think gravy, it's too hard, it's too hard. Um, and I have to look up how to do it. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens this year. We'll see what happens this year. Anyway, quickly, welcome, welcome, welcome to all of you. If you're not watching now, I don't know why I'm saying this, because if you're not watching now, you're not watching. Um, but uh, Jen would saying that would be a bucket list Thanksgiving. Wouldn't it be to be all together in real life? That would be great. Those are the kinds of things we dream of. SM Geis is saying, is Susan is, is saying, my mom made giblet dressing. Oh, don't even go there. I mean, I can't even, I don't even know what a giblet is and I'm sort of glad I don't. And, uh. So anyway, we could talk about, we could talk about Thanksgiving forever and we will on Facebook, on Facebook, because you know, here on Instagram, the comments is the word I'm searching for so unsuccessfully, the comments go away. Uh, but here, at least on, on Facebook, the comments stay and you can ask questions of Jilly, anything about her books, anything about her life. I know you'll have many questions for her or for me or for Hannah or about Thanksgiving and we can trade stuffing and gravy recipes and teach each other how to make gravy and how not to burn the rolls. Uh, so, so anyway, anyway, um, quickly, you know, if you're not watching today, you can, you may be watching on video because Hannah and I. Um, archive all of these first chapters on video. Now, you, they'll, this will be episode 111 of all craziness um, in our archives on IGTV, here on Instagram, and on our videos here on Facebook. So you can dip in and have a little delicious first chapter um, whenever you want, which will never have oysters in it and will never be burned. And even for Hannah, it will not taste like turkey. It will just be 
delicious. Um, and if something happens on Instagram or on Facebook and the system crashes, we'll put up a video, we'll do it again, we'll come back and make sure that you have um, episode 111 of First Chapter Fun, The Fantastic, To Tell You the Truth by Jillian McMillan, which is truly one of the best books of the year. I, I love this. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it. So are you ready? Without further ado, um, 111 make a wish, says Lynn. Yeah, you know, do you make a wish at 1111? And also 1111. We're talking about when the clock says 111 or 1111. I see that all the time, don't you? I see, I see that all the time. And I wonder if that means something. So another time we'll talk about that. Uh, because I want to get to this book. I want you to hear this book, which Marissa is saying, this one is compulsively readable, says Marissa, and she knows her stuff, the Barnes and Noble mogul. And um, it is really true. This is this is one of those irresistible books that you cannot put down. Uh, someone, someone, there was a review on one of, one of my books on, on something, on, what is that word, Amazon, that said it was a turn pager a turn pager. And I don't know whether that was what she meant to write or whether that was just enthusiasm, but this is a real turn pager. That's, um, that's what I say too. Two babes in a bookshelf is here. Welcome, darling one. Happy Thanksgiving on Instagram. So let me tell you a little bit. Hi, Lisa. Let me tell you a little bit about, and look, Jillie Diane on Facebook is saying that she's already ordered this book and she'll be picking it up this week. As you know, it is out now and it is tearing up the charts and everyone is talking about it. So I'm, we are so pleased um, here for Hannah and I to be able to Hannah and me to be able to read this to you. Julie saying, love turn pager. I know, it really got me. I thought it was, I thought, I thought it was so perfect. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about Jilly McMillan. Jilly McMillan is the internationally best-selling author of six novels, including What She Knew, The Perfect Girl, Odd Child Out, I Know You Know, The Nanny, and To Tell You the Truth. So this is To Tell You the Truth. I just gotta show you, this is What She Knew. This is, I know you know, this is the nanny. I mean, I just got all these from my bookshelf because I am such um, a huge fan. And there's a funny story about what she knew. I was reading what she knew and I left it in a hotel room uh, and I needed, needed, needed it. So I went to the bookstore at the airport and got another copy of what she knew and then the hotel sent me back my other what she knew so that means I have two copies of what she knew which one of them will go to one of you here on Facebook or here on Instagram just I will just choose from the comments someone to get this what she knew I knew there was more of a reason that I couldn't stop reading it that I had to actually buy two of them um, and now one of them will go to one of you. So just leave a comment um, about, about anything and I will choose one to get a copy of what she knew. Another fabulous Jillian McMillan book. Anyway, onward. A former art historian and photographer, Jillie studied at Bristol University and the Courtauld Institute of Art in London. She lives in Bristol, UK with her husband and three children. Jilly's novels have appeared on the New York Times, Sunday Times, Globe and Mail, and Der Spiegel bestseller lists, and have been translated into more than 20 languages. She's been described as one heck of a good writer by the Wall Street Journal, and her novels have been praised as nuanced, completely addictive by People Magazine, riveting by Publishers Weekly, and visceral, emotionally charged, heart-wrenchingly well told, so says the Daily Mail. They are also turn pagers, as we have now embraced that word here on First Chapter Fun. Let me tell you a little bit about To Tell You the Truth, and thank you so much to William Morrow, the publisher, and to Jilly herself for giving us permission to read from this today. Um, Nancy and Beth and Lisa uh, are saying they all sound great just from the titles. Um, Two Babes is saying, love that story too, Jilly, you rock. Um, so I'm just going to let the adulation pour in and Jilly can come back here on, on Facebook and read it. But let me tell you now a little bit from the back cover about To Tell You the Truth. To tell you the truth, everybody lies. 
Lucy Harper's talent for writing best-selling novels has given her fame, fortune, and millions of fans. It's also given her Dan, her needy, jealous husband whose own writing career has gone precisely nowhere. Now Dan has vanished, but this isn't the first time that someone has disappeared from Lucy's life. Three decades ago, her little brother Teddy went, also went missing and was never found. Lucy, the only witness, helplessly spun fantasy after fantasy about Teddy's disappearance to the detective's fury and her parents' despair. That was the start of her ability to tell a story, a talent she has profited from greatly. But now Lucy's a grown woman who can't hide behind fiction anymore. The world is watching and her whole life is under intense scrutiny. A life full of stories, some more believable than others. Could she have hurt Teddy? Did she kill Dan? Finally now, Lucy Harper's going to tell the truth. Cross her heart and hope to die. And let me tell you a little bit more about this book. Um, I was talking to Julie about it before I made the video, um, before I made the video for this book, which I hope you will watch. Because one of the things about this book um, is that all authors have this joyful moment when it feels like their characters are coming to life, especially their main characters are coming to life, that they have a mind of their own, that they have a voice of their own. And that happens to the main character, Lucy Harper, who is a best-selling author, here in To Tell You the Truth, except that her main character kind of won't go away and kind of begins to tell Lucy what to do. Um, so it is chilling, and anybody who's an author or a reader, and I know we all are both or, or eat one of each, um, will understand the struggle of the writer and the, that um, sort of relationship between the writer and the main character and how inextricable that can be. So keep that in mind when you hear the, I'm going to read you the prologue and the first chapter. And I know you're going to be reading this yourself when you buy the book, of course, soon, but Keep in mind when you hear this that every single thing in this prologue and this first chapter has multiple meanings. I mean, it is, this is so beautifully written and you won't know till the end that it does. So just sort of go with it and listen to this and you, um, it's just irresistible. All right, I'm going to put my glasses on just so I don't miss a word and you don't either. And so this is the prologue and the first chapter of to tell you the truth. Jilly, I, I must read this. The video is perfect, she says, probably be because it was created by a fellow author <laughs> who gets it. Thank you. That's so nice. I, I did feel that about this book. I'm hugging it now. Okay. All right, I'll read you the prologue and the first chapter of To Tell You the Truth. And here is the prologue. There are facts, and then there is the truth. These are the facts. It is the summer solstice, June 1991. You're only nine years old. You're short for your age. The school nurse has recommended that you lose weight. You struggle to make friends and often feel lonely. You have been bullied. Teachers and your parents frequently encourage you to participate more in group activities, but you prefer the company of your imaginary friend. We know you spent time that night in Stoke Woods because when you get home, leaves and pine needles are found on your clothing and in your hair. There is dirt beneath your fingernails and you reek of bonfire smoke. Home is number seven Charlotte Close, a modest house identical to all the others on a short cul-de-sac built in the 1960s on a strip of land sold for development by a dairy farmer. It is situated adjacent to Stoke Woods, a couple of miles from the famous suspension bridge that links this semi-rural area directly to the city of Bristol. We know you arrive home at 1.37 a.m., three hours and six minutes before dawn. As for the rest of what happened, you describe it many times in the days that follow and you paint, of course, an exceptionally vivid picture because even at that age, you have a facility with words. You tell it this way. The stitch in your side feels like a blade, but you daren't stop or slow as you race through the woods toward home. Trees are gathered as far as you can see with the still menace of a waiting army. Moonlight winks through the canopy and its milky fragments dot and daub the understory. 
The shining light shrinks shadows, then elongates them. Perspective tilts. You drive forward into thicker undergrowth, where normally you tread carefully, but not tonight. Nettles rake your shins, and heaps of leaf mold feel as treacherous as quicksand when your shoes sink beneath their crisp surface. The depths below are damp and grabby. It's a little easier when you reach the path, though its surface is uneven and small pebbles scatter beneath your soles. Your nostrils still prickle from the smell of the bonfire. It's easy to unlatch the gates to the woods car park, as you've done many times before, and from there it's only a short distance to home. Each step you take slaps down hard on the pavement, and by the time you reach Charlotte Close, everything hurts. Your chest is heaving. You're gasping for breath. You stop dead at the end of your driveway. All the lights are on in your house. They're up. Your parents are usually neat in silhouette. They are tidy, modest folk. A bonus fact, including your, you and your little brother, the four of you represent on paper the component parts of a very ordinary family. But when the front door opens, your mother explodes through it, and the light from the hall renders her nightgown translucent so you have the mortifying impression that it's her naked body you're watching barrel up the path toward you, and there's nothing normal about that. There's nothing normal about anything on this night. Your mom envelops you in her arms. It's as if she's squeezing the last breath from you. Into the tangled mess of your hair, she says, thank God, and you let yourself sink into her. It feels like falling. Limp in her tight embrace, you think, please can this moment last forever? Can time stop? But of course it can't. In fact, the moment lasts barely a second or two, because as any good mother would, yours raises her head and looks over your shoulder, down the path behind you into the darkness, where the street lighting is inadequate, where the moonlight has disappeared behind a torn scrap of cloud, where the only other light is rimming the edges of the garage door of number four, and every other home is dark, and she says the words you've been dreading. But where's Teddy? You can't tell them about your den. You just can't. Eliza would be furious. Your mum is clutching you by your upper arm so tightly it hurts. You have the feeling she might shake you. It takes every last ounce of your energy to meet her gaze, to widen your eyes, to empty them somehow of anything bad she might read in them and say, isn't he here? Okay, so that's the prologue. Um, would you like to hear the first chapter? I can hear you through the internet saying, yes, yes, keep reading, keep reading, keep reading, right? All right, I will read you chapter one. I typed the end, clicked the save button, and clicked it again just to make sure. I felt huge relief that I'd finished my novel, and on top of that, a heady mixture of elation and exhaustion. But there were also terrible nerves, much worse than usual, because typing those words meant the consequences of a secret decision that I'd made months ago would have to be faced now. Every year I write a new book, and the draft I'd just finished was my fifth novel, a valuable property, hotly anticipated in publishing houses in London, New York, and other cities around the world. Valuable property were my literary agent's words, not mine, but he wasn't wrong. Every day as I wrote, I imagined the staccato tapping of feet beneath desks as publishers awaited the book's delivery, and this time I felt extra nervous because I knew I was going to send them something they weren't expecting. Brave, Eliza had said once she figured out what I'd done. I'm sorry, I told her, and I meant it. Her voice had a new and nasty rasp to it, but everything has its price. Under different circumstances, Eliza would be the first to point that out, because my girl is pragmatic. I knew what I had to do next, but it was scary. I had a routine for summoning courage because it was always hard to find, frequently lost in the scatter and doubt of writing a novel. Counting to 30 took longer than it should because I decelerated. I'm a master of avoidance. But when I get to zero, I focus like a sniper taking aim. 
One tap of the finger and the novel was gone. Out there, 330 pages on their way to my agent via email, and it was too late to change anything now. I waited as long as a minute before refreshing my inbox to see if he had acknowledged receipt. He hadn't. I deleted emails from clothing retailers offering me new seasonal discounts because I thought they were traitorous messages reminding, reminding me of my internet shopping habit and a moment when something more significant was happening, though I did glimpse a jumpsuit that I thought I might revisit later. It was a buttery color, hot this spring apparently, and easy to accessorize. Tempting and definitely worth another look, but not now. I drummed my fingers on my desk refreshed again. Nothing. I clicked the back button and checked if they had the jumpsuit in my size. They did. No low stock warning either. Nice. I added one to my shopping cart anyway, just in case. Went back to the email. Refreshed again. Still nothing. Checked my spam folder. Nothing. Nothing there from Max, but good to see that hot women were available for sex in my city tonight. I deleted all spam. Re-refreshed my inbox once more. No change. I picked up the phone and called. He answered immediately. He has a lovely voice. Lucy, he said, just a second, he said. I'm on the other line. Let me get rid of somebody. And he put me on hold. He sounded excited and it made me feel a little fluttery. Not because I'm attracted to him, to him, please don't get the wrong idea, but because he's the person I plot and plan my career with. The gatekeeper to my publishers, negotiator in chief of book deals, firefighter in chief when things go pear shaped, and a recipient of a percentage of my earnings in return. Max and I need each other. I'm his most successful client so far, so it was no surprise that he'd been trying to contain his impatience as my deadline for submitting the first draft of this book had approached, delivering pep talks and confidence boosts via phone and email. Whenever I met him, I noticed his nails were bitten to the quick. He came back on the line after just a moment. I'm all yours. It's done. You bloody miracle. I heard his keyboard clatter as he checked his email. Got it, he said. There was a double click as he opened the document. I imagined his eyes on the first page. Seconds passed. They felt like millennia. Max? Was he reading it? Was he gripped by the first few lines of my story or had he scanned a few pages ahead and already felt the cold wrath of horror, the clutch of disappointment? My nerves were shredded enough that I could catastrophize a three second pause. I'll read it immediately, he said, right away. You must, go de you must put down the phone and go directly to celebrate. Do not pass go. Treat yourself, have a bath, open a bottle of something delectable. Tell that husband of yours to spoil you. I'll call you as soon as I've finished it. At the very start of my career, before I had visited Max's office, I used to try to imagine what it was like. I thought he was the type to have a leather chair, well stuffed enough to cradle his buttocks in comfort, and a big desk, its surface large and polished, so that it reflected light from the window it faced, which was probably ornate, containing leaded glass, perhaps, or framed with elaborate stonework. That was the kind of person Max seemed to me to be, in spite of his bitten nails, a puppet master. Only a puppet master would have a desk like that. I shared that thought with him once. We must have sunk a few cocktails, or I wouldn't have been brave enough to say it out loud. And he half smiled, the expression aligning his asymmetric features. But you're the one who has the power of life and death, he replied. Fictionally speaking, he added after a beat. True. Beyond the chair, the desk, and the architectural features, I also imagined Max's office would be messy. Beautiful bones framing disorder was how I saw it, and it was a very attractive image to me. I could find beauty in surprising things. You have to when violence reverberates through your work. I imagine every thriller writer will have their own way of handling this. And by the way, when I finally got to visit Max's office in person, I found it to be nothing at all like what I had expected. <laughs> okay, okay readers, do you see what I mean? It 
even it just lures you in. It's marvel marvelously written. It's completely textured and meta and fabulous. And oh my golly, um, what a good book this is. I am so pleased um, on this Thanksgiving. Tracy Clark is saying claps. <laughs> and Jilly is saying thank you for a fantastic reading. Thank you, Jilly. Such a treat to hear it and fun to read out loud because it is so well written and that really makes a difference. Um, you can totally tell by reading out loud how well a book is written, written and how carefully written it is. And reading the first chapter yet again and again after having read the whole book, I see how much it is there. So this is worth a couple of reads. Shannon is saying, keep reading. Anissa is saying, so grateful to see this live today. Great book. Sylvia is saying, happy Thanksgiving. And yes, happy Thanksgiving to all of you too. Um, it's a crazy day and we're so glad you're all here. Don't forget that I will send a copy. I've almost dropped it. That could have been cool. A copy of what she knew to one lucky commenter here on Facebook since on Instagram the comments go away. So if you'd like a copy to enter to win a copy of what she knew, zip yourself over to Facebook and leave a comment. Um, Sarah saying, yay, love it. May's reading. <laughs> uh, Amisha Quip saying, love it. Everybody's saying, love it. Everybody's joining and clapping. Debro is saying that went by too fast. Yeah, it did. And that is another proof of how good the book is. That's just about as fast as you can possibly read. Glennie's saying, to tell you the tr truth, I'm hooked. Isn't that so nice? I saw what you did there, Glennie. We saw that. Um, Carol saying, new Thanksgiving tradition, Hank reading me a first chapter of an amazing book. I will sign up for that. I will sign up for that, Carol. I absolutely will. Who knows what will happen next year at this time. Golly, we don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow at this time. But we do know that every Tuesday and Thursday at 12.30 p.m. ET, Hannah and I will be here reading you the first chapter of a wonderful new book. And Tuesday, we have... Blind Search. This is a wonderful mystery, Blind Search, by the fabulous Paula Meunier. She is fantastic. This is um, sort of uh, Julia, Julia Spencer Fleming with dogs. It's an adventure between with a, a woman who is an Afghanistan vet and her bomb-sniffing dog, and they are home, and they both have PTSD, and it is a lovely love story between woman and dog. She's a detective. Oh, I'll tell you all about it. We'll tell you all about it on Tuesday, but if you love dogs, and if you love mysteries, please come Tuesday to hear Blind Search. I'll hold it up one more time. Blind Search by Paula Meunier, a wonderful, evocative, brilliant mystery. Um, so you won't want to miss you won't want to miss that, um, and you certainly will not want to miss to tell you the truth. Now my desk is full of books to tell you the truth by the fabulous Jilly McMillan. Um, you all are phenomenal. Hannah and I are so pleased that you are in our reading family and in our reading community and in our lives now. Um, please stay safe. <laughs> please stay stay kind, um, and see you here next week. Love you all so much. Thank you, Jilly, and happy Thanksgiving to you all. Love you so much.